Hi, everyone. And welcome to the third dialogue of the seminar series, Flows, Infrastructure and Citizenship in India and China. To those who were here for the previous dialogues, welcome back and thank you for joining again. And to new guests, welcome and thank you for sharing the space with us. So since I described the overall intellectual aims of this series in the first dialogue, I won't go over that again. Um, but to those who are new here, please look at our web pages that we are, that there's a link for in the chat box now. Um, today's dialogue is called Infrastructure, and it reflects on how infrastructures and notions of citizenship coalesce and become useful for each other through flows of people, objects, and natural substances. What infrastructures are created to regulate flows for protecting certain notions and forms of citizenship and other such questions. The fo following dialogue on Friday will focus on citizenship and will be the last of the series. So some housekeeping, the chat function is disabled, but you're encouraged to write your questions in the Q&A box and I will read them out to the speakers from there. Now to begin, I'd like to introduce the amazing lineup of uh, scholars that I have the privilege to speak with today. Sonalini Kumar is an associate professor at the School of Global Affairs at Ambedkar University in Delhi. She was educated at Cambridge University, Delhi University, and Jawaharlal Nehru University. She has been awarded the Nehru Stevening Cambridge Scholarship, the Oxford Cambridge Society of India Scholarship, and the Fulbright Nehru Fellowship for Postdoctoral Research at Columbia University. Currently, Sonalini is a member of the Multinational Research Consortium whose project titled New States, New Societies is slated for publication at, as a special volume of Modern Asian Studies in 2024. Her scholarly concerns have revolved around the circulation of transnational development enterprise in the mid 20th century, state-making practices in post-colonial Asian states, and the politics of land acquisition and rural urban transitions. Amy Zhang is an environmental anthropologist who teaches in the Department of Anthropology at New York University. Her research investigates the intersection of ecology, technology, labor, and urban life. Her forthcoming book project explores how waste infrastructures, materials, and their technical interventions ground and condition the forms, possibilities, and limits of China's emerging urban environmental politics. Other writings have been published in Cultural Anthropology, Current Anthropology, China Perspectives, Made in China, and edited volumes such as Can Science and Technology Save China? and The Handbook of Political Ecology, among others. Finally, our discussant for today is Emma Park, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Historical Studies at the New School. She's a historian of modern East Africa, whose research interests include the history of technology, capitalism, infrastructure, and the state. She's currently completing a monograph titled Infrastructural Attachments, Austerity, Sovereignty, and the Politics of Expertise in Kenya. She's also working on another project with Kevin Donovan, tentatively titled The Digital Nation, Politics, Value, and Aspiration in Contemporary Kenya, which explores the entangled relationship between Kenya's largest corporation, Safaricom, and the Kenyan state. So um, I'll ask the speakers to begin now. We'll have Sonalini going first. <clears throat> Um, thank you so much, Saranda. Um, this is a really interesting series. And <clears throat> I did actually catch the first two um, uh, in the dialogue as well. And so I have a fair idea of the, you know, the richness of the dialogues that have been going on. So uh, thank you to you and to the New School for putting this together. It's also a chance for me to go back to <clears throat> some of the not... Uh, central, but I would say quite critical preoccupations that occupied me in the last 10 years, and I haven't had the chance to sort of really think freshly through it. And um, so that's also, uh, you know, thanks to you. Um, a small note of a small sort of caveat, especially to my discussant, um, Emma, which is that there is a tiny, uh, there's a slide that has some text missing. <clears throat> 
but um, so apologies for that. One of the um, slides in the PPT, but I've I've made that correction, so you should be able to see it. There was one sentence that was incomplete, and then there is this uh, part where I speak about the abrogation uh, of land rights and the um, forcing of villagers into a form of urban citizenship, but actually it should read both rural and urban, and I'll explain why. Hopefully by the time I get to that, uh, it should be clear to uh, most, if not all, what I meant. So I have a presentation. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I hope that's visible. Yeah, that's the start of it. So <clears throat> my research and you know what I'm going to talk about today um, is in it's not an unfamiliar story, um, especially in the global south. It's it's part of the history of urbanization everywhere, um, including the global north, but it is fresh in this memory of some of the rapidly urbanizing um. Uh, areas of the global south and that is um, again and I saw sort of like um, echoes of this in some of the other presentations but you know the the sort of the spatial exclusion um, and in my case I'm speaking specifically about the decimation of the rural areas when they get enclosed into the urban areas and this has been a like I said not because my work is on urbanization so it's not it it appears to be not central, but it's in fact quite critical. Um, it's quite a critical subtext to the entire story of urbanization in the global south. And again, like I said, it's familiar to, um, I mean, it's been written about from multiple um, angles. And what preoccupies me and uh, what fascinates me is the particular manner in which this happened in Delhi. So as you can see, I've titled my paper tying the camel and goat together. Um, and this refers to a statement made by a member of parliament in the 1950s on a debate on the Municipal Corporation of Delhi Act, which was one of obviously the major, um, the MCD, uh, uh, the Municipal Corporation Act, had in fact put in place uh, the modern post-colonial corporation for Delhi. And so while this act was being debated in the parliament, um, the rural constituents of Delhi who were feeling like this was going to be uh, an act that would sanction mass democratic dispossession in the city. Uh, one of them used this phrase, you know, merging the urban and the rural jurisdictions in Delhi together, which is what the MCD Act proposed. Um, and one of the things I want to actually establish in my in the, in the next few uh, slides is that uh, there were, I just basically, I'm, you know, it's in some ways a relatively straightforward talk. I'm actually just tracing the multiple instruments by which the rural was subsumed, submerged into the urban and then completely decimated. But it didn't happen in a straightforward way. There was a way in which step by step, there was a kind of progressive um, dispossession that was put in place. And there was also a separation, a very, very interesting separation of land rights from democratic representation. So that's the gist of my paper. And I'm going to proceed and show how that happened. Just some of the instruments. These are um, these are trends and these are patterns that are visible in Delhi even today. But the Delhi of today obviously looks very different from the Delhi of the 1950s. The Delhi of the 1950s, when, these, uh, when this story um, plays out was um, you know, all of the areas that were uh, that are outside the central core, the urban core of Delhi, uh, were almost exclusively rural. Delhi had 300 villages uh, inside its urban limits. And that's not a small number if you actually put the entire land area together. Delhi is also an example because of its colonial history of being a city that didn't expand due to so-called, quote-unquote, natural factors of urbanization. And this is a point that Narayani Gupta has made, but it expanded very much through um, large-scale land acquisition of rural areas. Not all cities in India, and certainly not all cities in the global south have grown like this. Uh, in Delhi, the, um, the history of land acquisition as a way to actually found newer and newer urban enclaves alongside the existing old and Lachin's New Delhi, 
um, it's dramatic in Delhi, in the case of Delhi. It's, it's, uh, and this is also, of course, made possible by the existence of the central government in Delhi uh, and its ability to use the Land Acquisition Act and the idea of feminine domain. So this is the backstory. <clears throat> One of the things that I realized when I was looking at some of the literature on rural Delhi, um, both in the parliament and in planning documents, and in also the language of the sort of Cold War, uh, post-colonial, uh, sort of Cold War American interventionism that was going on with the Delhi Master Plan. I, many people, uh, many of you might actually know this, that the Master Plan for Delhi was created with a collaboration between the Indian Town Planning Organization and the Ford Foundation. One of the... Uh, one, one thing that became really quite clear to me is that the villager in Delhi represented a really uncomfortable and um, difficult social subject and a political subject for the post-colonial state. Um, there were multiple at attempts at conceptualizing what the ideal villager uh, would look like in post-colonial India. And this had to be sort of accommodated within a, an overarching anxiety of the new state, of the new post colonial state and government um, on the question of capital accumulation. And the villager represented both possibilities in terms of accumulation, uh, in terms of what uh, the normative new role of the villager might be. And you can see that in the colonial period, as the second uh, point I've got on the screen is saying, um, some of these you know, discourses about the usefulness of the villager to uh, initially the colonial state and then to the modern modernizing developmental state. These are old discourses and sometimes it was old wine in new bottles, uh, but the ambiguity never went away. Uh, and it's particularly interesting to notice because, again, many people who study national politics and not just urban politics in India, uh, they focus on the, they assume that there is a kind of um, rural idiom or rural language or rural uh, imagination that dominates Indian politics. But that is true at only a very superficial level. Uh, what actually happened was that once the Nehruvian state actually chose a particular model of temporal planning, national planning, the villager was cast into this, um, this deep, deep uh, uncertainty as a national subject. This is just a photo to show how our national leaders dress. And you would have probably seen very similar photos like this, but the idiom of course of national politics remains rural, uh, but the actual villager with her or his uh, rural habits, uh, rural land tenures, rural forms of political expression became a problem. So as early as 1949, which is just a couple of years after independence, there were attempts to tie or sort of weave agriculture into the modernizing state. Um, the interesting thing about Delhi is that, so this is just some background information. Um, I think I'm gonna skip some of this because of uh, the lack of time, but this is just a background information on what the Congress party's overall national um, intervention into agriculture was. And we saw, we see a kind of um, version of that in the Delhi, uh, rural in the in the in the on the question of Delhi's villages. The so the Delhi region is interesting, but the what is interesting about this story is that the Agrarian Reforms Committee of 1949 recommended the kind of farming that is happening in Delhi as precisely the normative form that agriculture should take in the entire country. And that's because Delhi had a tradition of medium-sized peasant proprietorship, medium-sized farms with a very long, very well-established, and by long, I mean, by Indian standards, it's not long. It was only about 300 years old because a lot of Delhi's villages were um, pastoralists who had become sedentarized during the colonial period, but 300 years is not a short period either. And this was a form of relatively prosperous, but medium-sized farms um, marked by peasant proprietorship. They should have been uh, held up as a model for the rest of the country. However, the Land Reforms Act of 1954 practically abrogates private property rights in rural land, not in urban land, because they can't afford to do so, which is what my next slide is saying. But they made um, 
the, the Delhi villager subject to an extremely stringent list of conditions and basically could abrogate it, basically completely um, pull the rug from under uh, proprietorship rights and land. And in a tradition, it, this would be difficult for any villager to deal with, but in a tradition of peasant proprietorship, it was almost certain to guarantee the decline of farming as a profession and of agriculture um, as a profession. And we're talking about 300 villages here, so the impact was not small. The Land Reforms Act also made the definition of rural land rights that was given in the Land Reforms Act, in which the state becomes the super landlord, it made the Panchayat Raj Act, and Panchayats are local self-government bodies in Delhi, the Panchayats Act became inferior to the Land Reforms Act, to the definition of the proprietor in the Land Reforms Act, which was basically an abolition of rural proprietary rights. So you could not, in simple words, you could not use your rights of representation within local self-government to actually argue for the restoration of proprietary rights in land. So there was a separation of land as a physiocratic resource that is now owned by the nation and representation as a local and to a very large extent defanged superficial right. Now, one of the reasons that, if not one of the reasons, actually, this is where my research actually focuses. And as I said, the rural is part of the story, but my work is actually on the post-colonial urban land market that develops in um, Delhi and building on uh, work on pre-independence uh, Delhi, on colonial Delhi, people like Anish Manayak have shown that the urban land market that emerges in Delhi, even if it is patchy, becomes a very, very doggedly pursued source of accumulation for the new state, which explains why the plans for um, you know, development in Delhi, urban development in Delhi, necessarily, it wasn't simply colonial hangover. A lot of people have written about how it was just an old pattern in Delhi, like I had said at the beginning of the presentation, to expand not through the forces of ordinary urbanization. And this is a phrase that is found in countless planning documents. And ordinary urbanization might mean something like industrialization or the attraction or uh, you know, certain kinds of industries and services to the city, but it has proceeded through large-scale land acquisition. And of course, there was some uh, continuity between the colonial and the post-colonial here. But it was also that by the 1940s, a very, very serious, very competitive, very privatized set of interests in land colonization had developed in Delhi. Uh, combined with the partition boom in uh, population, Delhi's, decade, Delhi's uh, population uh, exploded between 41 and 1951 because of the effects of the partition of the country. Uh, and this has been talked about a lot. Um, because of that, the urban land market became a frenetic form of a source of accum accumulation. Um, now the MCD bill, which is, as I mentioned, was the one that formally proposed, this was an urban corporation bill, as you can see, but it formally proposed tying the rural districts, um, in, uh, uh, merging the rural districts into the municipal corporation of Delhi. And this is where one of the Delhi village Sarpanch is. Sarpanch is the title given to the head of the panchayat, who is the head of the local body. So the village headman, very loosely translated. He was the one who used this phrase, but this is going to be disastrous for the villages of Delhi. He predicted what would happen. He predicted the decline and the demise of agriculture and the slow erosion of even political representation, which is what happens at the end of our story. Um, and he was the one who used this phrase. You know, it's like tying the camel and the goat together. Um, but before, uh, and, and responding to the criticism is what you see on the screen here, the Home Minister Govind Balapan's patronizing statements about Rural Delhi make it very clear that the government was working with a very clear picture of who should sacrifice, which constituency should sacrifice for uh, the other. And you can see this last sentence, uh, the rural areas deserve foremost attention. It should be the duty of the corporation to look after the simple folk who have served us in the past. So this is this uh, idea of the Delhi villager. It's a kind of forcible idea because the villagers were not behaving the way that the national elites wanted to, what wanted them to believe. The political elites uh, kept casting them as simple folk, as rural folk, as a sort of, uh, uh, you know, as uh, the rural folk as simple. It's, it was kind of continuation of um, uh, a kind of benign paternalistic Gandhianism, 
towards the village and the Delhi villagers were not having any of it. They were protesting, they were fighting back, they were escaping, they were filing court cases. There were hundreds of court, court cases that were, that were filed. And in the process of actually uh, fighting these cases, the state began to define what it really meant by um, uh, eminent domain. Um, so, so it says, so the Home Minister says that we should look after the simple folk who have served us in the past and whose generosity we have virtually thriven so far. This is the quote about the rural areas being subsumed into the urban and like tying the camel and the goat together. This is the criticism of the MCD bill, right? Um, this is just a continuation of that. I can come back to this if time permits later on, but I think I might be um, short on time. So. This is a back and forth between, you know, critics in the parliament, opposition members in the parliament, who are pointing out very clearly what the provisions of the bill. And the bill is only one of the 10 or 15 very significant pieces of legislation around this question um, that were enacted in a single decade, that is the decade of the 50s. Uh, I've looked at the Delhi Development Authority Bill. I've looked at, I just mentioned the Delhi Land Reforms Act. There was an amendment to it in 1959. And there are several. And then, of course, there was the master plan, which went in for large scale land acquisition. That's a slightly more familiar part of the story. But this is kind of the prehistory of the master plan. This is what was happening in the decade prior to the master plan. Um, eventually, even the rural representation, uh, represent representation rights that were given by uh, the government, by the central government, because remember that uh, I Again, I, don't, I haven't mentioned this before, sorry, but if those, those of you who are not familiar with this history, Delhi statehood was abolished in 1956. So just before the Municipal Corporation of Delhi Act was debated in Parliament, Delhi ceased to be a uh, provincial unit and became incorporated into the central government as a union territory. Um, and then this also led to the eventual um, decline and erosion, dilution, decline of local self-government rights. Uh, basically, they, it was the, the right was stripped of all its true power until it ceased to mean anything at all. Um, so there was a lot of debate on whether Delhi's villagers are ready for self-government, and this, this particular screen shows that. In 1965, there was a further amendment to the Delhi Land Reforms Act. Remember that it was passed in 54, it was amended in 59, and then there was a further amendment by which um, the Gaon Sabha, which is the which is supposed to be the executive body of the which is supposed to be sorry the general body of the village and the panchayat is the executive body the gaon sabha the village council uh, was formally placed under the um, chief commissioner which is a you know it's an it's a part of the executive uh, and not non elected um, there was a judgment. So jumping to 2010 and to the contemporary time, there was a judgment in, there was a very tragic case of Delhi villagers being, um, the villagers of this, uh, you know, this place called Kanjhavla in uh, Northwest Delhi, which is around the area where Delhi University is located. So some of you, any of you who's familiar with that area, um, the villagers of Kanjhavla got into a, uh, an altercation with some Harijans, that's, that was a term that was used in the government documents at that time. Some Harijans, which is scheduled caste communities who were given land, um, which came out of the common land of the village uh, of Kanjarla. And so that was common grazing land or pasture land. And it's a very interesting and very important example. And this is something again that gets repeated. You know, this is like almost like a modular conflict that gets repeat, repeated around the 300 villages in Delhi where there's a constant playing off of two kinds of um, subalterns. So you have the villages of Kanjagla losing, they had already lost the right to legislate or to decide on the common land. They had lost their agricultural land through the Land Reforms Act and through the master plan and through the acquisition by both the government and by private interests, which was constantly legitimized by government. They also began to lose all their decision-making power over common land. And this brought them into direct conflict with the uh, urban subalterns who were actually given housing, very cheap, very low quality housing, but they were given uh, sort of rudimentary housing rights um, in these 
places which formerly had uh, the common land of the village. And so there was this uh, altercation that became a big fight. It became a violent conflict and some people died in police firing. Um, in 2010, and I'm almost done, in 2010, there was an appeal by the Kanjavla villagers uh, regarding their right to elect their own panchayats. Um, what the villagers said was that there was an egregious anomaly. So they rightly understood that there was an egregious anomaly in the fact that while they were disallowed from electing their own panchayats, the Gaon Sabha, which is the general body of the village, as a body remained functional under the Delhi Land Reforms Act of 1954. Indeed, it was under this act that villagers had ceased to be proprietary owners of any land that is not Sir or Khutkash land, which is basically uh, self-cultivated land. But the self-cultivated land had also been acquired by government for urban development. The plea of the villagers was negated by the judges, stating that a notification dated 31st of May 1994 was issued by the LG, the lieutenant governor, who succeeds the chief commissioner, whereby the entire area falling within the local limits of, limits of New Delhi Municipal Committee, which is the central core of Delhi, was declared as a small urban area. So we don't need to go into the details, but the fact is that the villagers rightly understood that having um, lost the right to legislate on their land, right? Um, they, they, if they were actually incorporated into an urban area, then the Gaon Sabha, which is a village council, a village general body, should also have been dissolved. If they were actually incorporated into the municipal corporation, then by logical extension, the Gaon Sabha should have ceased to exist. The Gaon Sabha, however, becomes the instrument, the chief instrument, by which village land is ironically brought under the central jurisdiction. So the government does not seem to have the political will to actually completely dissolve Delhi's villages in one go. It does it in these sort of in this piecemeal fashion and the villagers understand that and they go to court and the court doesn't rule in their judge in their favor, which is the standard pattern for cases like this. Now this was, I'm just going to, I hope I have just a couple of minutes to wrap up. So I'm going to say that these are the some of the thoughts that I thought we could actually um, discuss further. And I, I see that there were some uh, very nice overlaps with Amy's paper uh, in terms of spatial exclusion and so on. And also, the I, I, I just wanted to flag the question of flows, infrastructure, and citizenship towards the end. But one of my, uh, so the one of the things that I've been thinking about with these events that I was looking at is that um, the entire idea of representation as citizenship in the modern state rests on merging territorial rights in whatever form, even in places where the right to property is not uh, absolute, but territorial rights, rights to residence. Residence uh, includes the right to access urban services or rural services, the right to access the entire gamut of state services with political representation. Um, this, by separating the right to representation of Delhi villagers vested in the rural Gram Panchayat and the right to vote in Panchayat elections, which was also abrogated, but then it is it has been restored through this thing called the Mohalla Sabha, and I can talk about that later. But by, by even this act of separating the representation, the right of representation from the rights over land that are alienated to the Gaon Sabha and then, then put under the uh, Latin governor and then directly under the uh, central government, the fundamental union of territorial membership and political representation has been broken for a section of Delhi. Uh, repeatedly in parliament, court judgments and master plans, urbanization has been described as the inexorable flow that governs the lives of residents in Delhi. It is like a force of nature. It's not a product of human choice. It is um, inevitable. And uh, it's always described in the language of flow. Uh, but over and I would say also sort of within this flow are placed layers of governance juris jurisdiction, which is what I've been discussing uh, in this paper that merge rural and urban areas for the purposes of expropriation. Uh, and land is now emptied of its multiple meanings and eventually eviscerated in use and exchange value for the original proprietors. Uh, finally, a diluted form of citizenship has been enforced on Delhi villagers by shackling them within rural and later urban representative bodies. None of those elections actually represent their rural rights. So that's why I'm saying that they've been shackled under first under rural 
And then when the rural representative bodies were abrogated, then under urban representative bodies, uh, while having actually lost. Uh, so I feel that this, um, this conditional and highly limited form of citizenship um, has been a means to not directly um, disempower the Delhi villagers, but to do it in phases. All right, I'll stop there, thanks. Great. Let me just get my slide up here. Okay, well, thank you so much um, to everyone. I just want to begin my talk today by thanking everyone at the new school, ICI Saranda, for the invitation to participate and to Sunalini and Emma for their um, conversation. I'm, um, I think there's a lot of overlap that uh, we can draw out at the end of the talk. Um, so my presentation today is um, based on a book project that I'm currently wrapping up, tentatively titled Ecologies of Descent, Waste and Urban Politics in Post-Reform China. So broadly speaking, the book project traces the implementation of technologies and infrastructures um, used to realize China's green authoritarian approach to cities. And I trace in particular um, Guangzhou's effort to implement waste management systems under the techno-utopian approach of the circular economy and the ways that this project elicited a set of novel and diverse environmental action and contestations among its city dwellers. Um, so the, my work, in, more broadly speaking, has been interested in um, tracing a set of um, waste matter and different infrastructural forms, anything ranging from animal life um, to end-of-life technologies that we're more used to, like waste energy incinerators. And in today's talk, I'll focus primarily on the effects of spatial displacement that China's effort to build green cities have, has had on its informal migrant collectors, also rural subjects, um, whose daily labor has become a form of waste infrastructures in the post-reform era. And I hope you know this um, talk will draw on um, many of the things that Yiming um, had commented on um, in drawing out the forms of spatial exclusion and acted by new green ecological development and to Sunalini's question in which, you know, she's trying to look at, as she said, you know, the, the kind of um, decimation of rural space um, by the urban. And similarly, my paper is seeking to draw out the process in which rural subjects and their right to inhabit and to work in urban space um, has become gradually uh, more tenuous um, as well. So in China, as with uh, many cities across the global south, um, informal scrap collectors, along with hawkers, peddlers, street food vendors, constitutes an informal economy. In China's post-reform city, migrant workers help to broker the transportation of waste from household to waste markets in the peri-urban and rural districts, a process that facilitates the diversion of household scrap and its transformation into resource that make up what Rosalind Fredericks has called a, quote, vital infrastructure of labor. China's post-reform informal collection sector, however, em emerged really only in the wake of the dissemination of China's official state-run system established during the Maoist uh, socialist period. Um, here in Chinese cities, um, the process of liberalization more broadly of, of you know, uh, land markets, of, um, uh, of state sectors, also coincided with the introduction of agrarian reforms that initialized a shift of rural laborers into its megacities. Those rural migrants who were unable or unwilling to take up wage employment in sectors like manufacturing, construction, or the services sectors in the 1980s and to the early 2000s gradually turned to the collection of, of scraps. So informality thus reflects a fundamental shift in the regime of labor in Chinese cities at a moment in which urbanization have come to rival industrialization as a key driver of development. In China, the reproduction of a consumer lifestyle and urban services, such as sanitation and the removal of trash, is predicated on the presence of these uh, and labor of these rural bodies. 
Yet the force of China's increasingly neoliberal and real estate turn to urbanization also continues to push out rural migrants from urban centers. And thus the informal economy highlights a contradiction um, of a capitalist mode of urbanization within China's cities. So the informal has been described as a sub-economy um, by Vinay Gedwani, a population that's fully inside capitalism, but who continues to suffer the ongoing processes of dispossession. And he uses this concept of infra-economy to describe how informal collectors both constitute the underside of urban uh, service delivery and whose labor is continuously denied recognition by the state, but who remains somehow vital to the production of urban space such that it is conducive for capital accumulation. So the everyday labor practices of informal collectors reveal how forces of spatial exclusion and displacement are at work at the heart of China's modern cities that simultaneously rely on these informal practices as a form of infrastructure, but who also continues to perpetuate uh, forces of green development that perpetuates a form of spatial exclusion, particularly um, on those who are associated with, with waste. So in Guangzhou's Tianhe districts, um, scrap has become a critical source of resource and livelihood for the urban poor, yet efforts to shape the city's image according to a sanitized orderly aesthetic under the official pronouncements of building a green and modern city um, have continued to target migrant bodies and um, especially those associated with waste labor. So when labors who are made infrastructural are made obsolete by modernization schemes, a new contradiction is produced in the creation of green cities. What appears to be a state investment in creating an ecologically minded and politically neutral form of urban development that emphasizes sustainability have at the same time perpetuated an aesthetic of green modern de development that further displaces and un undoes in a, in a way the infra economy responsible for, sus uh, for sustainable practices in the first place. Um, so efforts to generate this ecological feel in urban centers through signature architecture in the central business districts, through sanitation campaigns, um, in other words, through these very acts of manifesting an ecological green city, um, further um, perpetuates an aesthetic of green urbanism that impacts the capacity of informal collectors to work in urban space. So in the last 20 years, um, Tianhe has transformed from a peri-urban district in Guangzhou's eastern reaches that was dotted with sports stadiums and villages um, and all sorts of scrap depots to become the city's second central um, commercial hub. So in the early 2000s, municipal plans proposed the construction of a new central business district in Guangzhou, um, designing a north-south axis that runs from Guangzhou East train station to down to Hydru district in the south. And this new corridor um, contained a new commercial core filled with skyscrapers, upscale shopping centers, and an ecological corridor. So Tianhe CBD aimed to signify Guangzhou's rise as a global cosmopolitan urban center through the creation of zones that married an ecological sensibility with the pursuit of commerce. So Zhujiang New Town sits at the heart of the new CBD, a north um, in the middle of this new south axis, um, linking shopping centers um, connected by a walkway and multinational uh, hotels adorn each side. You know, for those of you who've been sort of in China or in other global cities. This, this is a pretty familiar landscape, but for those who are not, this is sort of what it looks like. And the walkway leads to a series of these signature buildings designed by global star architects, including um, an opera house, a stadium, and state-of-the-art library. And as a new town development, uh, real estate and commercial space is interspersed um, throughout this corridor. And threading this, this new kind of commercial corridor is sits this new um, ecological corridor. And this is akin to the sort of wetland development that um, Yi Ming was talking about with similar sort of aesthetic features of manufactured landscaping, wooden walkways, and, and artificially implanted palm trees. The ecological corridor explicitly uses elements of nature to lend this ecological texture to, next to the glass and concrete buildings. So skyscrapers now 
now tower over a blanket of greenery with a series of wooden walkways winding through high rises with clean lines projected upward. And this projection of order at the ecological corridor is similarly reliant on a continuous labor of ordering. So each day, you know, throughout this crowded commercial center, the wooden walkway is regularly scrubbed, the landscaping regularly replanted. And so the achievement of the, this very orderliness and ecological aesthetic relies um, on this renewed, um, sustain, is sustained by rural laboring bodies who works backstage, right, tending to landscaping, hauling away waste and um, scrubbing city streets. So Wang and Li are a couple in their late 40s and they're rural migrants from Hunan province that I worked with closely in my field work. And they had been collecting scraps from outside of a housing complex in the Eastern part of uh, Tianhe district for the better part of the last uh, 10 years. So unlike waste pickers who um, you know, sort through waste bins or urban gleaners um, or itinerant buyers who travel from um, neighborhood to neighborhood trading in scrap commodities, Wang and Li have a semi-permanent space with a regular clientele. So they're sort of parked regularly outside of this uh, urban housing district. So from 10 a.m. to just uh, to about just after 8 p.m., seven days a week, they can be found at this depot consisting of a couple of square meters of sidewalk between the security gate to the housing complex and the CBD. So closing up shop every night meant that they would, you know, sell their collection and hide their handwritten advertising behind the entrance. So while technically positioned outside the complex, Wang and Li's trade um, relies uh, almost wholly on this sort of a local um, local ecology, and they they pay a small monthly fee to the building security for being able to to host their depot, and this secures sort of a spot that they can return to day after day, which allows them to build up a regular clientele who knows who to call when they have scrap to sell. So local police um, derive their authority over informal collectors in part from an official stance that see Wang and Li and the work of informal scrapters, uh, scrap collectors as objects of policing and reform. So in the eyes of city inspectors, Wang and Li and their scrap business are elements captured by the phrase Zhang Wan Cha, a state discourse and a mobile descriptor of the very characteristic that needs to be eradicated for the achievement of the green uh, modernity that they're uh, pursuing. So Zhang Wan Cha loosely translates into dirt, chaos, and backwardness or deficiency. Each character carries uh, multiple meanings. So zhang, which is filth or dirt, um, can be easily mapped onto space, but also renders um, people associated with waste work um, as, a, as objects of dirt. Luan um, identifies a form of spatial chaos or disorder, but also refers to this idea of unruliness and criminality. And cha carries this temporal connotation of backwardness and, and, and inadequacy, a reference to a linear development time, um, the kind of negation of the futurity implied by this modernity. So together, Zhang Wan Cha is a concept that re, uh, re renders urban space and rural bodies into this very project of development. And so like the state discourse of su zhi or quality, Zhang Wan Cha is a descriptor that brings a set of these abstract qualities into to commensuration with the project of governing um, in an increasingly neoliberal era in China. And here, you know, neoliberal, but now sort of authoritarian green as well. So whereas the introduction of the term suzhi indexes anxiety about the low quality of the Chinese population that was the subject of Chinese um, reforms in the 1980s, Zhang Wan Cha is, especially maps these displacement um, of these fears, right, about, about filth, dirt, disorder, ruralness, onto questions of the production of urban space. So in planning discourse in China, Zhang Wan Cha um, has been used to describe urban villages villages and neighborhoods, spaces of migrant life, you know, characterizing them as cancers of the city, and whose very eviction, right, signals the arrival of modernity. And migrant livelihoods, right, um, that increasingly involves these informal um, uh, activities of hawking, begging, collecting of informal waste, is particularly targeted um, as these sort of activities that violate new ideas of commerce and spatial order. So in an effort to promote the kind of 
you know, uh, development in green cities. Um, China has also implemented a series of national campaigns that place cities into a competition with each other, in which um, every city every year is ranked according to a set of metrics. So during official city inspection days, especially um, under the sanitary city campaign held every September, each sort of district in the city is evaluated according to a set of targets. And campaigns aimed to reform Zanlan Cha aim to target spaces of waste collection in particular. During annual inspection campaigns, um, the Bureau for Public Security, for Sanitation, and other municipal management bodies conduct um, inspections on both licensed scrap depots as well as to kind of um, get get rid of informal collectors. So um, security cameras are often installed at scrap depots, um, ostensibly to guard against those who remove right official public infrastructure to sell them, such as you know different pipes or wires or um, street signs. Um, with really sort of sought after metal commodities. Um, but really, you know, they're also a form of um, surveillance and policing as well. Neighborhood Safety Inspection Bureau officials often drop by during these days randomly for unannounced inspections and licensed depots are often fined for disorderly and haphazardous practice, right? Paper piles and scraps and wires, you know, not piled neatly enough that they are accused of violating safety codes. And here we see how an aesthetic of orderliness um, is prioritized, right, and performed, right, um, as an achievement of green cities. So at the start of every sanitation campaign, the security guard reminds Wang and Li of the impending inspection, and the couple knows immediately this is when they need to disappear. They carefully hide their three-wheeler and pull a tarp over their scrap. They scrub down the sidewalk. Um, where they normally do their trade, and then they sit and wait for the inspector to come and go, sometimes putting their business on hold for days, and they willingly accept this loss um, for the kind of uh, ability to return. And just to wrap up, um, given the time kind of constraints, the experience you know, of informal collectors in Guangzhou, as I hope to show, illustrate the extent to which the aesthetic ideals of China's ecological urbanism, characterized by the pursuit of sustainability as a strategy to elevate um, Guangzhou into a world city, comes to enact another level of regulation for rural migrants. So the aesthetic or representational logic that's embedded within China's project of urban modernity also regulates right um its project of of what counts as a sustainable and modern waste management system what counts as a modern um, infrastructure so in guangzhou the ideals of green urbanism perpetuates uh, a form of urban governance by evicting rural bodies as a way of creating an aesthetic ideal of modern order and this is a central paradox at the heart of tianhe cbd even as the goals of sustainable waste circulation relies on an existing infrastructure of informal labor this aesthetic of greening um, is achieved really through the ejection of rural bodies. Um, and also just to open up for discussion, what I didn't get to is the second half of the paper in which um, I was interested in charging uh, or in charting the elaboration of a set of spatial adaptive strategies or what I call um, alternative circuits that informal collectors mobilized as a way to evade uh, the spatial regulation that they face. So migrant collectors also in turn mobilize a set of temporal spatial strategies to kind of facilitate the circulation of waste um, and to advance uh, a politics of place. So, you know, I was really interested in um, advancing the kind of set of conceptual repertoires that we use to chart the particular um, forms of citizen resistance that emerge alongside infrastructure that we've sort of talked about in previous dialogues, particularly, you know, under this project of um, green urban planning and development. And, you know, thinking about what a bottom-up type of um, contestation and strategies might look like beyond our current repertoire of thinking of, you know, weapons of the week or quiet encroachment. Um, so, yeah, so I think I'll stop here and just uh, uh, look forward to Emma's comments and, and questions. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to dive right in. Um, 
so first, uh, th thank you both for these really interesting papers, and thanks also for the invitation to join you all in conversation today. Um, my hope is that this will proceed as a dialogue, so I don't have uh, super formal um, um, comments, but I did want to kind of elevate some shared themes that I um, that I saw running through these papers, um, and invite you both sort of to reflect on on these on these um, shared threads, despite the very different context that you're that you're talking about. And then I do have some specific questions for each of you, but um, perhaps we'll we'll um, leave that aside depending on how. Uh, audience participation goes. Um, so one of the things, right, that I thought was a really interesting and, and, and beautiful shared interest of these papers is the kind of dialectical relationship between the rural and the urban. Um, and I understood this both to be to be operating at at least two levels, right, both discursively and materially. So I'm interested in the kind of shared interest in a kind of structural account, right, of the kind of parasitic, metabolic, I mean, I don't know what language we want to use between, between the, the, the rural and the urban. And, and, you know, in the case of your work, Amy, this is much more clearly in terms of labor. Um, and Sunalini, in, in your work, it seems that this is uh, predominantly about questions about land expropriation, right? Um, and so I guess one, one question I had to kind of throw your papers at each other is, is there a kind of labor component to this metabolic um, uh, dialectical relationship between urban and rural in the case of your work, um, Sunalini, and, and are we, is there something that we can say about land um, expropriation in, in the context of what you were telling us, Amy? Um, so related to that, you know, while I understand both of you to be quite interested in um, the kind of violence of these forms of displacement, I was also curious to hear more about the self-identification of the, the rural populations that are actually your object of political concern. Um, so, right, we, we sort of know what the state's saying about these folks, but I, I and this is, I, I guess, an invitation for you to lead off where you kind of left us, Amy. What are the kind of weapons of the of the week or whatever language we want to be using? Um, what are the forms of self-identification, self-apprehension of, of these um, migrant migrant laborers and, and of these uh, rural communities? Um, right. Um, right, and then I think there's like a kind of interesting paradox here, which maybe comes through, um, you know, is, is made very clear, I, th I think, in both, both contexts and comes out of this kind of dialectical, structural, but also discursive approach is that like the urban actually depends on that which it formally excludes. So I'm wondering how we like can think about that. And it, in that in, in relation to that, I was wondering about sort of, Amy, how you in particular think about the category of the informal, because it seems to me that it's the like occluded but absolutely essential center. So, so how do so how do we kind of reckon reckon with that? Certainly, the language of informality or the language of disorder um, performs work in the world, right? It justifies forms of state intervention, um, and yet, like that's part of the ideological case the state is making. But to look at the material connections, it seems like that falls apart. So I'm kind of I'd be kind of interested to hear um, more from from both of you um, in in that regard. Um, right, and I'm thinking here with people like Raymond Williams and also historians Bill Cronin, right, this kind of dy dynamic co-constitution um, of the urban and the rural. Um, I was also interested in hearing a little bit about um, the infrastructures you see at, uh, as being at, at play here. It seems that one kind of shared thread is to look at legal architectures as infrastructures. And so I was wondering if that's sort of a, a, a domain of the infrastructural that you're inviting us all to think, think with, right? Or is the argument more that like legal architectures have infrastructural effects insofar as they lead to kind of transformations of, 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 of material environments and um, transformations in who is allowed to occupy what sorts of spaces um, under what conditions and when. Um, and then and then maybe because uh, I feel like I've sort of asked you a specific question, Amy, or it's been more um, direct in, in your case, Sunalini, I was wondering, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like, well, I understand there's a kind of incremental 
um, process at play here of disenfranchisement and 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 the kind of withdrawal of rural proprietary relationships with the land um, over the over the course of the period that you outlined for us. It seems like there's a big shift between the 50s and the 90s. Am, am I right in, in that? Um, and so I was curious about about what's going on in that in that moment, what you see as being the broader structural transformations. And I ask this in part because one of the stories that we tell ourselves or are told about processes of neoliberalization are about processes of decentralization, right? Um, uh, and and the devolution of authority. And so I'm like interested in in that in relation to the story you're telling us, which is really a story about centralization, so far as I understand it. So anyways, just a, some some scattered thoughts for you to run with if any of it is is of interest and I, I can sort of come come back in with other questions as we get going. Thank you. And I don't know that we decided how we were gonna um, proceed, but. I think maybe we can reverse the order and have Amy respond first, if she's okay with that. Sure, yeah. So thank you so much, Emma. Those are um, really excellent questions and comments. There's quite a lot of them. <laughs> so maybe I'll just uh, answer um, like a couple maybe together and then we can um, follow up on the conversation. So first, um, I think your question was how does land, right, how might land play into this story of labor dispossession that I'm telling? And actually, you know, thank you for the question that the the um, the kind of chapter this draws on is is very much concerned with the ways in which the um, the gradual sort of uh, displacement of these informal collectors is both of their capacity to live as well as to work in the city. And this includes the types of um, urban transformation that Sunalini was talking about in which these rural villages that are so central to the reproduction of not only social life, but labor, right, um, are becoming transformed. So similar to, um, you know, Delhi in Guangzhou, you know, the city has um, pursued this sort of, you know, uh, I guess what you call this sort of engineered urbanism is um, kind of understanding it, in which the state consolidates land for large property developers. And this was a key strategy of um, Chinese municipalities in the 90s. Um, and this is the story of China's sort of urban turn, right? So China had this sort of natural urban Organization, as you call it, in which industrialization led to the transformation of rural land into factories. But then, you know, in the 90s, starting in the 90s, there was this very conscious effort by municipalities to use land as an accumulation strategy. And, you know, part of this is the erosion of these collectors to access um, or, or rural villages within cities, right? Silly cities within uh, villages within cities as um, not only spaces to uh, live, but, you know, places where they can store scrap right? So it's a really sort of spatially intense sector. Um, these sort of eviction um, strategies within cities, right? Um, uh, as well, right, in, in terms of setting up these temporal stalls relies on using access to sort of sidewalks and other public spaces. So I think, you know, it's it's a story of of land of being sort of removed from land once again in the city, right? Um, a story of you know um, accumulation by sort of urban dispossession in a use way, but also in terms of you know access to land um, for sort of the, the 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 kind of way that you know ways can circulate requires sort of sort of pockets of messy land that becomes increasingly um, inaccessible. Um, I think the other question was about you know the the kind of self-apprehension of these rural communities how do they kind of think of themselves right and sort of what what is informality doing um the third question i'll probably think about them together and i think you know for me you know these these rural migrant collectors what i was interested in is you know i think a lot of anthropologists have been trying to write against this idea of thinking of waste as the abject right and and of waste laborers as sort of like you know these sort of abject figures and here within um the city center and within the scrap trade in chinese cities it's become very um it this this sort of anti-objection is very, made very um evident because they think of themselves as like um entrepreneurs as traders right so they are not 
um, they're not, right, they're not, some of them could be wealthy, but most of them, you know, think of themselves as pursuing a vocation. So part of my work, um, what I'm interested in is thinking about this as, um, as a, a labor sector and a, a workers as participating in the labor sector with or without the permission of the state. And for me, um, you know, this idea of informality I've kind of struggled with a lot, both in this chapter, but within the larger project in general. And I think what I'm really interested in is increasingly using the informal to kind of puncture the the kind of um, increasingly way that ch the Chinese state has been pursued as this, you know, hegemonic authoritarian machine, right? And I think through the kind of, you know, 90s, early 2000s, China scholars have been really good at showing the ways in which the Chinese state has to rely on a lot of these informal processes in order to function. And it's always a collaboration between the limits of the state, right? Even authoritarianism has many limits. Um, I think COVID sort of maybe, you know, pre-COVID, but also the C regime has sort of returned this idea of the strong, dominant, all-powerful authoritarian machine. And um, I think if you just look sort of on the ground, this is clearly not the case. So I think I'm writing against this authoritarian green, green, you know, authoritarian ecological urbanism um, perpetuated by China as this really powerful force, right? And using informality as a way of rethinking that. So I'll just leave it here. Thank you. Um, thank you, both of you, Emma and Amy, because, um, yeah, excellent, excellent observations. And in fact, I think um, your comments, Emma, actually give me a chance to clarify one of the larger sort of frames uh, within which I possibly clarify the kind of literature uh, on Indian urbanism that I might be speaking with and also perhaps speaking against sometimes. And by which I mean, and I, I would not be taking the questions in any particular order, but I'm hoping to cover all of it uh, because they've really made me think. Um, the usual story about, I mean, the urban studies is a relatively, relatively new field. And I, I think this is also tied up with uh, the understanding of India as a predominantly, you know, the rural national idiom that I was talking about, that there was this assumption that our, you know, our national political discourse is overwhelmingly um, about uh, the village, about, you know, the, the, this is the way that Indian politicians present themselves. And I just sort of, I think the sartorial politics are not irrelevant here because I think that remains the language in which um, the political elite actually present, present themselves. There is a great, even now, even now with, um, you know, lists of best dressed politicians and so on coming out, I think the, the rural uh, idiom is really, really central to national politics. But I think the kind of literature that I'm, and the kind of story of urbanization, Indian urbanization, that I'm possibly speaking at an oblique angle to, and sometimes quite directly against, is the is the coinciding of urban studies as a field in India with the idea that um, Indian cities became sort of sites of bourgeois environmentalism in the 90s and 2000s through a series of uh, exclusionary moves um, of the rural, of the poor, of the marginalized within the city. And uh, also this assumption that the cities of the global south had their urban moment post-liberalization. Um, what I found looking at the archives, and I don't claim that Delhi is representative here of Indian urbanization in general. In fact, it's quite a special case. But I think it's also an extremely illustrative case to show that the mid 20th century was a moment in which the urban had already uh, come to Delhi, had been established in Delhi, not only as a mode of accumulation, which is the part that I focused on on my paper, because urban land in Delhi also as a site of accumulation for, of immediate accumulation in a, in a context of a very low accumulation, low industrial development economy, um, urban land becomes a very dependable resource. And it's almost as if when I'm examining the parliamentary debate on Delhi in the 1950s, the Nehru government realizes this quite belatedly, but serendipitously, and then it starts to pursue um, urban land markets. Uh, and this is a private public collaboration in the establishment of what urbanization is uh, right before, I mean, even before the master plan. The master plan is filled with fantastical notions of what the Delhi villager and their role is 
in so in terms of self representation which is an excellent point um and and something that i'm still grappling with um in a nutshell the delhi villager does become urban it he becomes she becomes an urban subject willy nilly uh, whether or not the national and um the political elites and the urban elites are recognizing them as such in fact the persistent discourse about villagers in and around delhi and in the national capital region is that they are not proper urban subjects that they fail and this is this sort of uh, echoes what amy was saying that they are um you know they are threats to the body politic to a proper urban civic citizenship but the fact is that they are incorporated against their will primarily against their will i mean predominantly it's not as if I, you know all of them are many of them also so the story is obviously much more complex than that but in terms of large scale uh, expropriation they are uh, forcibly sort of inducted into the urban and then they become urban subjects of course and their self representation is like amy said um of businessmen of entrepreneurs there are some classic professions that delhi villagers get into um so initially they are milkmen so milk supplier market gardeners um transport people in the ncr region that i looked at in greater delhi um they also become labor contractors uh for the industries that are allowed to creep into delhi despite the very severe regulations in the master plan and delhi being a kind of non industrial city you know the hinterland of delhi is absorbing new industry in a huge huge way and here we we see this very classic sort of conflict again in terms of pitting subalterns against each other the delhi villager becomes uh euphemistically de described as labor contractor but they become so involved in semi criminal not entirely legal operations around the supply of labor uh and about the control and, and and the kind of policing and disciplining of labor for these new uh industrialists that are uh, setting up in the in the hinterland so for the villagers uh in the core of delhi the 300 villagers that were acquired right after um independence they are you know they are as much part of the urban workforce of delhi as you know as as the properly urban subjects who do also have urban property rights um delhi is even in its urban areas very very largely um characterized by informal housing right so a bulk of delhi housing and this is really ironic because the last uh, year we've witnessed an absolutely um egregious assault on uh some of the most poor and marginalized urban communities of delhi in the name of encroachment there have been massive anti encroachment drives right uh, and it's absurd this idea of encroachment in delhi because the city is basically a gigantic um informal settlement um formal housing constitutes even now a minority of the housing stock in delhi um and so villagers are you know they're very much part of the urban fabric they're part of the kind of urbanism that scholars like Sol solomon benjamin and ravi sundaram have spoken about where if it, even if it doesn't you know it's uh, if you look at the normative idea of the urban which actually only gets repeated in policy documents but on the ground uh, what the urban means is uh, multiple complex claims to the city and multiple complex forms of work and labor and residence in the city right and variegated and com complicated maps of tenures um there are th there's a dizzying categorization of informal settlements and government policy in delhi so you have slum clusters you have uh, unauthorized colonies you have regularized colonies you have regularized unauthorized colonies and so on and so forth all the way till you know secure urban property tenures so um in terms just i'll just say one more thing about so the the story that i'm sort of tracing and this was a surprise to me as well is that the the conventional story uh is that urbanism comes late to delhi urbanization proper urbanization comes along with neoliberalism but this is a much older city there are discourses of delhi being uh, the you know there are instances of delhi being described as a world class city in parliament in the 1950s so there's a kind of mid 20th century high modernist um urban moment that delhi is very much part of it's a global moment actually um the expertise that we use for our master plan is 
sort of uh, people associated with the New York Regional Plan, in fact. Uh, most of the Ford Foundation experts who came were involved in designing the Greater New York area, and they had a chance in Delhi. In fact, they speak about Delhi as a chance to undo the wrongs of New York. So, um, you know, the, the lack of urbanism in New York, they have this great fantastical hope that it can be instituted in Delhi. Along with that go possibly, I mean, actually fantastical notions of how the Delhi villager fits in. The Delhi villager is supposed to sacrifice not only for the nation, but for the dream of urbanization. And all this is happening in the mid 20th century. So I just feel like this story about, you know, Delhi having, or Indian cities becoming bourgeois at last in the 90s, which is the title of a actually excellent article by uh, my former mentor, Partha Chatterjee. Um, this is a story that I'm partly contesting. There was always forms of urbanism, always forms of urbanization and self-representation, even while the villagers were fighting court cases. They were living properly urban lives. Um, if we have a non-normative understanding or a non-textbook understanding of what the urban is, and I would imagine this is the case um, with many other places in the global south. Um, I'm not sure if if you want us to continue in dialogue. I see there's some questions in the Q and A as well. Uh, um, yeah, so should I, uh, should I throw out those questions now? I guess, okay. So there are, there's a question for Sonalini. Are there any evictions in Delhi municipality due to COVID-19 with real estate problems? And another question um, from Aditi Day for Sonalini. Was there any indication in your archival research on how these urban villagers were perhaps imagined as potential reserve of laborers in the city for various industries and even spatial developments? Additionally, connecting your work with Sushmita Party's recent book on jats in Delhi, how far were villagers able to capitalize on real estate opportunities or was that a very small part of a larger story of displacement and disenfranchisement? For Amy, there's a question from Enrique Valencia. Do waste pickers practice forms of mutual aid among each other? Also, do waste pickers see their work through an environmental or sustainability lens? If so, how does this fit in or challenge notions of state-led green development? Karanda, I'm so sorry, but could you repeat the first question to me? Sure. Um, from Sharon, <clears throat> are there any evictions in Delhi municipality due to COVID-19 with real estate problems? Real estate problems, okay. Um, the COVID-19 was uh, very, I mean, for migrant labor in general in India, there were as many of you would know, um, you know, very heartbreaking stories of the, because the lockdown was so suddenly um, announced in March, 2020, um, and people did not have a chance to return to their villages. And a lot of labor in Indian cities maintains a base in the village. Not that it's, it's the case in, you know, all, all of those instances, but a very significant number of migrant villagers, a migrant labor in the city, oh, just labor in the city, uh, maintains rural routes. And some of the, a lot of the employment, especially around construction and the construction boom post nineties has been seasonal um, and has sort of cyclical, has a kind of cyclical, uh, you know, nature. So uh, because it's not full-time employment for 365 days, and because land, even if it is small land holding, provides some measure of security. And of course, there are social networks and social capital that the villagers can draw on. Uh, there was this absolute exodus of, uh, you know, because the villagers rightly, the, the sorry, the labor rightly imagined that there would be a period of long unemployment when the lockdown was announced. There was this massive exodus. It was it occupied the national media for a while and the stories were absolutely heartbreaking. So during the lockdown itself, I'm not aware of any 
uh, sort of crisis, any kind of further crisis from the state on this question, uh, apart from the actual um, labor exodus, uh, under very, very distressing circumstances. Uh, post uh, opening of the lockdown, however, which is post the third wave, uh, which is in the last year, as I had mentioned, there has been an enormous amount of anti-encroachment evictions, anti-encroachment drives as they are called. And in fact, the bulldozer, I don't know if some of you have been hearing about this, the bulldozer be has become associated with a form of strongman politics, first performed in the urban area, but now it's become a kind of national political idiom for the right. Uh, and there was actually uh, an India rally supporting the current government in New Jersey, I think, that had the bulldozer as a symbol of good government in India. So post COVID, the evictions have, um, and the anti-encroachment has uh, really taken off. Uh, the question about Sushmita's work, which is wonderful on the villages of Delhi, there's a lot of overlap uh, with this part of my research. Uh, and absolutely, um, I think Aditi is the one who asked the question. There is, um, you know, there's been, multiple, uh, you know, opportunities for Delhi villages to convert their uh, resources into um, real estate, but it's shaky forms of real estate. It's not exactly secure because rental properties are the only kinds of properties that they're able to, because they don't have, um, they don't have rights over, they do have landlord uh, rights over what was called the Abadi area, which is the actual settlement area. They lost their land, they lost their farming land, but they were able to hold on to their residential uh, land, which is uh, now converted into these very steep sort of high story um, structures, some of them with illegal floors on top and everything, which are lent out to migrant labor. So yes, the opportunities for real estateification in a way or just, you know, renting out are um, many, but um, um, it's also a very, very mixed picture because it depended on, there were a lot of communities that used to work on the land but did not have Abadi rights, settlement rights or residence rights. They've completely been wiped out. And come back to the question of labor that Emma asked, in a way, Amy's and my paper um, are talking about two phases of the same thing. It is the displaced populations that become part of the service industry uh, and so on. And in again, I sort of return to my point about if we are looking at this story from the bottom up, then these represent a form of urbanism. Um, you know, the, the, the vast dispossessed and their absorption into the urban labor market also represent forms of urbanism that many others have. I mean, that's not my project, but that's worth studying. I hope I've answered. Um, great, so thank you, RNK, for those questions. So I think, you know, I think, I can answer each of those questions, but I think they're excellent because they get to kind of the heart of the trouble of, of this work, right? So, you know, do waste pickers practice forms of mutual aid? Um, you know, do we label it as mutual aid? There's, you know, there's a general horizontal, com you know, camaraderie in a sense, right? There's the sharing of information. These scrap nodes are very much... Um, nodes where people from similar provincial regions of China can go to their fellow, right? Um, compatriots and share, you know, information, share and trade. Um, uh, so, you know, part of the idea is to not paint this sort of stark neoliberal landscape um, and to kind of track the horizontal networks that are forming. Um, your second question was, you know, do they see themselves as, you know, um, environmental workers? Does that help in sort of staking claims? How does this challenge it? Um, once again, right, they jokingly talk about how they're, you know, they're the most environmental of all the citizens, right, in the city. Um, but this doesn't scale up into actual terms in which they um, can articulate a politics, right, against the state. And so part of the trouble of that I'm trying to grapple with is how to come up with new kind of concepts and terms that reflect this very ambivalent position that these scrap collectors are caught in that um, evade some of this political language that comes out of a, a, a liberal framework, right? So, you know, we kind of think of labor organization as, you know, inhabiting certain formal qualities, right? You have to, 
have claims making, you have to have like a organization and you have to take it to the state. And none of that quite exists in the same way under authoritarianism, particularly this is still a population that's living with huge precarity, yet they are um, in their work and in their sort of language articulating um, something more than just sort of a weapons of the weak, right? So I'm trying to figure out how exactly to characterize this, this type of, you know, spatial sort of political claims, right? Is there something political by returning, by just reasserting their sort of right to kind of continue their trade, to return to certain spaces? Um, how do we think of these strategies of evasion? Um, so that's sort of what I'm grappling with. And yeah, so I thank you for the question. Um, there's also a question sent anonymously um, about the role and relative influence of NGOs and like civil society organizations. And this is for both Amy and Sonalini. Like, do NGOs support informal and migrant workers in Guangzhou? Uh, do villagers and um, targets of anti encroachments in Delhi, do they turn to um, NGOs? And what kind of relationship then do they have? How do they mediate between the state and um, these target populations? Sorry, maybe I'll just continue. Um, yeah, so thank you. So yeah, so NGOs are a really interesting case because there is sort of the rise of, um, you know, environmental NGOs in China. And in China, over the last 10 years, there's been a real rise of waste NGOs, right? NGOs that specifically focus on waste issues, whether they be contesting anti-incineration and, and especially to promote um, uh, recycling campaigns in China. So the other side of the story that, you know, I didn't tell is that as there are sort of like informal spatial pressures to evict informal sectors, there's, you know, a promotion of formalizing um, citizen recycling, right? Because the vision of the green city is that middle-class citizens as in the West, right, are the true environmental subjects who will sort their waste. There will be a neat way that waste gets then, you know, transported to end of life um, systems. And that's really the vision of the state. And many of the environmental NGOs in China um, kind of step in as sort of implementers of this campaign, right? So if the state doesn't have local bureaucrats who can go out and, and help citizens recycle, then there can be civil society members who do that. Um, so, you know, I see um, NGO action very much as um, you know, facilitating a politics of 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 citizen recycling that that is you know one that is that supports the vision of the state. Um, that being said, there are NGOs who um, you know mostly in Beijing who have kind of connected with more global networks of waste picker alliances and waste picker rights, and they. Um, they do go out and you know work with waste collectors and support waste collectors, but I think that's very much in the minority. So the the kind of civil society action that is you know um, that sort of like emerged alongside the state project is very much one that you know advances sort of like a, a you know a bourgeois environmentalism in cities. Yeah, I think it's the same with waste. Uh, um, NGOs working on waste in Delhi, there was a kind of high point, a high, kind of a high moment of NGOs being uh, treated as formal stakeholders by the Delhi government. Um, about 15 years ago, there was a lot of talk and people writing on uh, the urban, uh, the new neoliberal urbanization in Delhi um, were ambivalent about these developments because there was a very selective um, sort of, you know, nomination uh, of stakeholder, uh, you know, there was this creation of the category of the, the normative stakeholder. And of course, it comes with a whole set of normative behaviors, you had to um, behave in a particular way, you had to petition in a particular way, you had to, you know, sort of uh, fulfill certain uh, roles. Um, and NGOs were located at the intersection of that. And there were different kinds of NGOs. I'm sure it's the case in China as well. They were funded and non-funded. There were people, there were NGOs that looked more like they were working from the ground up with the waste pickers. Uh, and then there were NGOs that looked more like they were comfortable inside government circles or funding circles. And so there was a whole, but that moment's actually completely passed. And one of the reasons is that the Delhi government 
um, the De Delhi statehood was reestablished in the 90s, and that has created a center state conflict in Delhi. Um, so the national government is of a different party. It's the right wing uh, uh, BJP and the local government is the pro-governance, anti-corruption, sort of social, sort of broadly social democratic um, Amadmi party, the People's Party. Um, and so I think that the national attention given to these kinds of collaborations where NGOs could in fact intervene and be uh, formally inducted as stakeholders, that has uh, died out uh, to a large extent. But I think just coming back to the question of labor, this is something that I thought about. Um, you know, in terms of um, in terms of staking claims to the city, I was just thinking about what Amy ended with. And I was thinking when she was saying that, you know, where do we go from here? Do we think about weapons of the week? Do we think about quiet encroachment and so on? Um, I think that many claims to the city are made through employment and not residence. So that's the distinction that uh, in, in a way also that interesting sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the way her, her, paper, her work and my work um, diverge in a way, because I'm talking about the claims that are made through residents, uh, but they are not the claims that, that are most successful in the case of Delhi. The ones that have been more successful, because this is a city that is a massive mas machine of accumulation. Let's remember that this is a city that has grown exponentially the NCR, the National Capital Region, is together, in, at least in population, if not in territory, is larger than many countries in Europe. So if you're talking about the sheer scale of labor that is required to keep this growth machine going, claims made on employment tend to have more success than claims made on residence. Even in residence, all governments, central or state, have been much more sympathetic to urban residence claims than rural property claims in Delhi, because the idea is to grow the city one way or the other, is to have the city functioning. And many of those claims are partial proprietary claims, urban property claims are partially granted. So you will have things like the Regularization Act passed by the parliament, which will not give you freehold rights, but it will give you leasehold rights. Um, and even those, fade in comparison to employment-based claims. Employment-based claims do better in Delhi. I don't know if that's the case in other places. Not always in the shape of formal organization because that's that threatens the government, especially this particular government. So if you have formal hawkers and vendors and waste pickers associations, that's no longer, that historical moment seems to have passed where they can uh, collectively organize, but they can do quiet claims, uh, and and those are uh, respected. Those are allowed. Um, we're nearly coming to the end. Um, it's it's nearly eleven thirty, but it's really interesting that um, urban infrastructural development bring labor in for construction work while also pushing labor out through displacement from land and jobs. So we see like this inward and outward flow wherever there is infrastructural development. And at the same time that labor itself, as Amy points out, that labor itself is infrastructural because it is the grounds on which things operate um, uh, or, or, or you know, on which material form is built or services are provided like waste management. So, and crucially what this highlights, I think both the papers is, the tenuous nature of the rural person citizenly status, despite being so very infrastructural for the idea of national development in different ways, you know, uh, what both the papers show. So um, I think like both of your papers really exemplify this relationship between flows, infrastructure and citizenship that we're trying to get at over here. And it's amazing that the infrastructural nature of the services provided to the city for free by essential workers um, without whose labor and services, the city would either come to a grinding halt or perhaps turn into a big dump yard. Um, you know, that gets completely obscured and sort of replaced by this discourse of how Amy, you pointed out cancer of the city or like parasites and, you know, anti-development or, or something to be policed, you know, as if the city is doing them a favor by letting them stay 
or by letting them maintain their rural lifestyle or their rural status, as Tsunami also showed us, instead of the other way around. Um, so thank you both for these very empirically and historically rich papers, which have taught us so much about urban citizenship and urban flows that often play out over the body of urban infrastructures. This was really a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Emma, for your very insightful comments. Um, so, I, yeah. May I just add one thing that, that, that sort of is coming up for me and as I was reading the papers as well, but I, I didn't get to sort of mention it. It seems like there's like a kind of crucial um, dynamic interplay between processes of exploitation and expropriation. And I guess I just like sort of offer that as a, as a kind of use, like in use, useful in thinking about like, not simply kind of um, this, like, you know, these infrastructural dynamics, but also the role of the state in smoothing out processes of capital accumulation, you know, and, and, and by virtue of like, in, in what, what are the modalities by which capital is being accumulated? Because it does seem that it tacks back and forth between straightforward exploitation, right? That this is this would be the what a kind of labor account would have us believe and these processes of expropriation, whether of kind of un, unwaged labor on the one hand or or land on the other. So anyways, I just wanted to offer that final reflection. I don't know if either of you that resonates for either of you, but fascinating. Right, so um, we do come to the end now. Thank you very much to the audiences. We have one final dialogue, so please join us again on Friday at 11 a.m. EST. And um, yes, thank you, and bye-bye.